Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, what's up, everybody? My name is Matt, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Uh, the Broken Elevator does the best introductions ever. Andy, that was touching and heartwarming and feels entirely too nice for a drunk like me. Um, thank you, Tam, for asking me to come back and speak here. I've spoken here a couple of times before. Uh, this group is one of those groups that, or meetings, that has taken Zoom by storm, uh, mining out some of the best messages you can find across the world. And uh, it's a joy and an honor to be asked to to present my experience here. When Tam asked me to speak, she asked for a topic or a title for the share. Uh, And I usually go with whatever the first intuitive thing is. And this time it was everything or nothing. And, And we know that this comes from page 53 of the big book, or maybe we don't. Um, I'll read some of that at some point today and get to why that came to mind. Um, I'm not entirely sure where this is going to go, if it's going to be linear or not. Um, I I hope to never get to the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous and rattle off a couple bullet points and then say, life is awesome. Thanks, Alcoholics Anonymous, and go about my day. I, um, I always pray before I speak. Uh, that God quiet my mind a bit and open my heart uh, and use my mouth to speak his words. And just saying that out loud, uh, I get a little emotional. Um, I am an emotional wreck lately. I will say that, and not in a bad way. Um, I'm just raw and sensitive. Uh, Andy mentioned that we're doing a Big Book Awakening workshop. Um, As we do this Big Book Awakening workshop, I myself am going through the steps again. And I just finished five, six, and seven. I'm in the middle of writing eight. And and I got choked up staring at my my two-year-old daughter's Adidas because Jesus, aren't little sneakers the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life? And um, But what qualifies me to sit up here and talk to you about myself, about my experience, about Alcoholics Anonymous, and about God, and I'll try to keep that brief because I'll tell you that I love talking about God much more than I love talking about myself. And, you know, I got here in 2016 after three years of insincere attempts to get sober and one year of an, of honestly attempting to get sober. And what happened was, is that I drank to excess. And Brenda J says, uh, what I drank, how I drank, how often I drank is not really important. You just need to know that I drank enough. Right. And, um, but I, I, I am, and maybe some of you can relate. I'm really hard headed and I can be really stubborn. Right. And, and so when I first came here, I didn't necessarily want to believe you. Right. And I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. I always have been, um, And so I will usually think that I can come somewhere and I will learn your language and I will read your books. And then what I'll do is I'll pretend to be a part of. I'll poke holes in your theories. I'll quote your books and then challenge them. I'll debate someone so I can sound like I'm important or smarter than. And that doesn't work here. There's something about Alcoholics Anonymous that That whether you want to or not, it's going to drive the truth out of you. And it's going to force you to confront your own truth. And so my first couple trips to Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what I tried to do. I tried to be profound. I tried to steal people's experience and go to other rooms and speak about it as if it was my own. Which coincidentally was the same thing I did at the bar. I was a fraud. I was a liar. And dishonesty was sewn into the fabric of who I was. And the best thing that I could do to treat living a life that was so uncomfortable and so inauthentic 
was to drink. Right? And so you guys told me that I was powerless over alcohol. And powerlessness sounds like weakness to me. And so I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily ready to concede to that at the very beginning until I see it in action. And so after relapsing a few times over the course of a year, God bless you if you've had a relapse. It doesn't have to be a part of your story, but if it is, it was mine. And I've been sober six years as of a couple of weeks ago. Right? <clears throat> and so I watched as I drank against my own will. I watched as I've been drinking continuously for months, had the flu, couldn't get out of bed for five days, got out of bed and said, Matt, you've been, you've been, you haven't had a drink in five days. Instead of picking up the bottle, just go to the meeting. This is me talking to myself as I'm pouring the vodka. Right? I didn't understand when I got to the bar, sitting next to non-alcoholics, guys I worked with, who could get up and leave and go make their daughter's soccer game or get home to the wife so she didn't complain too much or who were just trying to kill some time so that traffic would die down before their long trip home, how they could just get up and go, and I could What I have come to learn is that powerlessness in the sense that we talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous means that when I start drinking, I can't stop. Everything I've ever wanted, the solution to all of those problems that I feel, whether consciously or unconsciously, are promised to me in the drink that is to come, not the one that's in front of me. And so I can't stop drinking. I have an unquenchable thirst for alcohol. And after I've overdone it again and again and again, like the doctor talks about, I'm left with these feelings of guilt, shame, and remorse. And oh, damn, I did it again. And I'm checking my wallet and I'm checking my phone and I'm inspecting my car. And I'm wondering who I hurt, who I beat up, why, where'd all my money go? All of this other stuff. Why am I feeling empty, guilty, ashamed, afraid, and anxious? I can't do this again. And yet my mind, by the time happy hour comes, has concocted a reason why I will handle myself like a gentleman this evening and I should go out for a drink. But that's not even it either. And I think the most difficult part of this whole deal for me to really understand when I got here was this idea of unmanageability. Right, you'll hear it called a whole bunch of different things. You'll hear uh, the spiritual malady. You'll hear this, this inherent disconnection from God. You'll hear all sorts of things. The book describes how it manifests itself on page 52 in the bedevilments and how I can't control my emotional nature. I'm prey to misery and depression. I'm having trouble in personal relationships, so on and so on and so on. And I can look at all of that and see that it's true and still not be convinced that a drink will, won't fix it. Right? The thing is, is that this is my existence on my best day, on my own power, relying on my own skills, intellect, emotions, attitudes, defense mechanisms, you know, uh, habits. And I come crashing into the lives of the people around me because all I can do is focus on me. All I can do is think about me. All I know how to do in relationships is serve myself. All that you ever are to me when I get here, right, is, is, is a means to an end. And so to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing that I'm confronted with is an unselfish person, person handing me a cup of coffee saying, sit down, get comfortable, welcome home. I'm skeptical because I do believe that everybody we encounter in the entire world, all across our lives, are mirrors of ourselves in some way or another. And so how is it that I can be so dishonest and so selfish and so self-seeking and so inconsiderate and walk into a room full of people who seem to just be pouring love on you with no ulterior motive? Right. 
of all of the things that I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, the most simple and yet most profound thing I've learned here is authentic love. Somebody's unmuted. And, and that happened from the very first time I came here. My very first meeting years and years ago, somebody pulled me aside and said, if you don't get a sponsor in this deal, man, you're screwed. And I thought that he was judging me. I thought that he was looking at me as if I was different or wrong or worse than. And what he really was just trying to tell me was a very simple way that I could have some success here. I came back again. And when I would come in the rooms and I would say, you know, I know what I need to do this time. I know what I need to do. One of the old timers would say something out of the side of their mouth, like, I know, I know, I know. How's that knowing working out for you? And it sounds salty or rude or curt. But the truth of the matter is it's love. Right? And my sponsor, God bless him, when I would come back and say I did it again, as I would become to start to develop the ability to become more uh, uh, just a little bit more honest than the last time you just give me a hug you said okay poppy let's start over again so me learning and and witnessing and experiencing the love from alcoholics anonymous is the first thing that starts to heal this spiritual malady this disconnect from god Right, because as we come to learn when we get here is that my trip through the steps is going to heal my mind. The way that I think, the way that I approach life, my relationship with alcohol, and it's going to start to heal my relationship with you. Right, and the physical part of my disease gets treated by the fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. The more I hang out with you, the less likely I am to dram a drink in my face, period. It's really that simple. And service and Alcoholics Anonymous heals my spirit. It makes me whole again. And what I don't see when I get here is that somebody else's 12th step becomes my first. Somebody else's attempt to heal their own spirit begins to shine the light on my ability to heal mine. And now I understand all of that in retrospect. I don't necessarily understand that when I'm shaking, coming through the door, scared for what this is going to mean for me in my life. And I learn all of these things about myself and I learn my step one truth and I'm confronted with a terrible diagnosis. And that diagnosis is that I'm going to drink. I am, I am, I am on a, a, a runaway train headed for the next drink if I can't find a relationship with God that will derail that train. All right, Chris S. said at the first Fellowship of the Spirit conference I ever went to, he said, the only way that I'm not going to drink is if I'm convinced that I'm going to drink. And that took me 36 hours to understand what he meant by that. By the end of the conference, I was like, ha, I got it. But if I don't understand what power this means, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to confront the hopelessness of my situation and I'm not going to reach for God. Right. And I tell this story a lot because it's, it was, it was such a God moment. And I like to paint the picture of what was going on in the room when it happens. And so when I finally learn these truths and they're starting to make their way through my thick head and down into my heart, when I'm really trying to getting to the point where I'm conceding to my innermost self that I am alcoholic. I'm sitting in a 10 p.m. meeting of the 79th Street Workshop on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And it was, it was, the 10 p.m. meeting was, it was madness, right? It was like all of these, these beautiful young people who used to come and hang out and like fellowship really well. And then the other side of the room was homeless people who came there for the Oreos and the coffee. And and yet there was this this feeling of one, wonderful sobriety going on there, and and there's a guy from the Atlantic Group speaking, speaking. And if you don't know about the Atlantic Group in New York City, there it's a huge, fantastic group. Does a ton of service, in Alcoholics Anonymous. But if you're a member of the Alcoholics of, of the Atlantic Group and you go speak, you have to wear a suit and tie. 
for the men, right? And the women have to dress them. And um, and I also forgot to apologize to the great nation of Canada for not wearing a tie myself. They take that very seriously. I don't know if there are any Canadians in the room. Um, and so, and so there's the, the guy from the Atlanta group is up there speaking and he's crushing it. He's, he's absolutely carrying a really powerful message. And I'm, I'm in, I'm locked in. There's a guy in the front row, right? And I can tell this story this way because he's my friend now and I've been given permission. And so he's covered in tattoos, right? And he's bald headed and he's kind of slumped in his seat and he's got like flames and phoenixes all over his body. And he looks like he could be the, an extra in a, in a South Central gang movie, right? And he's flirting with the idea of putting hand up of, of, of sharing and not sharing and sharing and not sharing. And, and I'm judging, right? Because this is me starting to open my eyes to people and, and the world for the first time, really. And so we have the guy who's all done up, spitting spiritual fire from the podium. And then we got, and I'm looking at him and I'm like, what is this guy going to say that's going to contribute to the meeting? And he's the very last person to share. And he says, you know, when I was out there trying to kill myself, God brought me here. He says, so now that I'm here, why would I question for a second if God's going to see me through? And it clicked. I was at that meeting on that day, digesting the truths of my step one. And I was meant to hear what Chris had to say that day. You see, I couldn't understand where God fit into the idea of sobriety. See, I'd had a relationship with God. I grew up in the church. I found my way back into the church. And yet, I couldn't understand where God fit from the steps into my life to keep me from drinking and to allow me to show up in life. And the truth was, is that I didn't deserve to be sitting in that seat. If you listed all of the things that I'd done, all the people that I've hurt, all of the, all of the, the manipulation I'd taken place in, and, and before I got there, why I didn't deserve to be alive or to have a job or to have custody of my child or whatever it was. And so if God brought me here, why wouldn't he see me through? It was as simple as recognizing that my experience with God before I got here wasn't going to serve me anymore. That if I was going to have a successful relationship with God, if I was going to make it through the steps, if I was going to establish that conscious contact that you guys talk of, it was going to have to be experiential. It was going to be something that I could see and feel and touch and something that a, a, a mere willingness to believe would have the, the ability to blossom into like a deep-seated trust. And I'll tell you that six years later, I have a trust like I've never had in my life. But the first thing that I have to do is remove myself as a possible solution to my problem. Right? The first thing that I have to do is remove myself because everything that I've ever done to get sober, to heal relationships, to fix broken things, breaks more things. And the thing is, is that when I, re when I relieve myself of the responsibility, there is relief in that. And there is this opening up of hope that I've never felt before. You mean I don't have to figure out my life in a day. I don't have to know how I'm going to pay off all this debt. I don't have to know how I'm going to be a dad. I don't have to know how I'm going to stay sober. I don't have to know what tomorrow is going to look like. All I have to know is that I don't have to fix it anymore. Thank you, God. came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Well, I have to believe that there's a power greater than me. I have to be willing to believe it. And I have to know how crazy I am 
right? And sometimes it's just as simple as the insanity of alcoholism, right? The decision that I make stone cold sober to pick up a drink. But as I move along, I'm going to return to this idea over and over and over again, because whose idea was it to order 37 pairs of sneakers last month? Why do I need four gym memberships? What am I putting in the place of God to make me feel okay? Because my mind, once I'm sober, will trick me. My ego will tell me that I'm sober now. I got this. And I will move through life not even realizing that I'm only handing God the parts of my life that I think I can't handle. And I will fool myself into thinking that there are any parts of my life that I can. Everything or nothing. On page 53 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the middle of the page, it says... When we became alcoholics crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? And we often look at this step two idea as magically arriving at the conclusion that God's going to fix the problem. Right. And in the end of the in the end of, of we agnostics, when they're telling the story and he says, you know, circumstances made him willing to believe. Meaning that I, I once I recognize my step one truth, it makes me willing, right, prepared to take action upon the idea that God can fix the problem. But that willingness has to has to be followed by some action. And in the beginning, the action is that I decide for God or against God. I have my guys go through an exercise where they list all of the bedevilments, right? One by one, all eight of them. And I ask themselves, I ask them to ask themselves where they stand on these bedevilments if God is nothing. And then I ask them, where could they stand on these bedevilments if God is everything? I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Like, you, we can all figure it out here if you think about it. Like, if these things that are listed, right, that keep me disconnected from life, they're the manifestation of my spiritual malady in my life. If they keep me disconnected, and that's the best that I can do on my best day on my own power, if God is nothing, I don't really stand a chance. And what happens is that I'm going to tumble backwards when the emotional pressures of life become too much and a drink eventually is going to sound like a good idea or maybe worse, I'm going to be left in a place where I have no God and no drink and there's no more miserable place for an alcohol. You see, once I recognize that God is everything, Right? It is the opposite of the hopelessness that I feel in step one. When I recognize that I'm going to choose that God will be everything in my life, it blasts it wide open for hope. And I'm, and I'm ready to go through the steps. When I recognize that after that night in that meeting, I was ready to go through the steps. And since then, I have always been ready to go through the steps. I have recognized, I have been able to recognize, I have developed an awareness that when I'm having trouble in relationships, it's not you. (laughs) When I'm having trouble with my children, it's usually not them. When I'm having trouble at work, it's usually not the guys at work. There is some part of me, there is some part of my life, there is some some facet of my existence that I am trying to hold on to, that I am trying to manage. Because I will, at times in my life, come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I will tell you a profound message, and I will say, God, handle my sobriety, and I'll tell you all of my experience here, and it may, because I can carry a message, sound like I work a perfect program, but I promise you that I don't. And as I move through the steps, I recognize that I'm angry. 
and I will continue to get angry. I had a guy with 30 something years recently tell me when I told him that I was going through a fourth step again, he said, well, if you do the, do it right the first time, you don't ever have to do it again. I said, well, I'm, I don't, maybe I'm just extra, extra sick. Right. But I'm, I've told to continue to take personal inventory and the things are going to build up. It's going to come up. I'm not, I'm not pff, Harry Potter wizard wand. It's white as snow. The minute I do my first set of inventory and I no longer feel anger and I walk through the halls of the world, like some, some monk in a constant state of Zen. It's just not how it happens. Right. And so as I moved, I, I, I come to this place where I'm, I'm going to start letting God into every part of my life. And so I continue to do this inventory because I have to keep looking at the places where I'm not letting God in. The cunning, baffling feature of alcoholism is not alcohol. Never once did I sit down at a bar. I've been to bars and restaurants and parties and, and, and sweet 16s and weddings and you name it since I've been sober. Right? Crazy raves on the beaches of Costa Rica. Like I've done it all. And never once has a bottle of alcohol come over and said, psst, psst, hey, 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 you want some? You know, it's, nobody's around. Never once. The cunning, baffling feature of alcoholism is my, my ego's ability to reconstruct itself and transform in a way that makes me think that I'm constantly okay or that something you're telling me is wrong or some part of my life that needs to be worked on doesn't need to be worked on or that everything's okay over here and if I just don't look at it, it'll be fine. I didn't come here for that. I came here to constantly be mining at the idea of less Matt, more God. And if that, if I am to do that, I need to constantly be looking at where I am trying to be the solution to my own problem. How can I contribute to Alcoholics Anonymous in the best possible way? It's not quoting the big book from the podium. I can promise you that. The way that I contribute best in Alcoholics Anonymous is sitting person to person, sharing my experience in a way that sheds a little bit of light on God's ability to show up for us if we just let him. Right. And what happens when I get here is not that I'm struck spiritual, struck altruistic. Right. And now I'm perfect. And let me explain to you how perfect I am. What happens when I come here is that I learn that I'm going to constantly be working towards this spiritual perfection that I'm never going to attain. What I will have is an opportunity to progress and get closer to God over and over and over. Again. And I find the most effective way to do that is inventory. I find that the most effective way is to put it on paper. You see, I have Alcoholics Anonymous for help. I have outside help. And when I explain to my therapist that I write my prayers down, right, a practice of mine in the mornings that I've gotten back to is instead of just sitting there, because what will happen is is that I can get into a place in my sobriety where I have a daily checklist. And as long as I check those boxes, I think that I'm okay. Check, did you pray? Check, did you meditate? Check, did you call somebody? Check, did you go to a meeting? Check, did you write a night meeting? Notary? Check, get to bed. And I checked all my boxes. And I go through life mindlessly checking boxes. And I wake up one morning and I realize that I've only been doing those things in me. Right. And so I've started writing my prayers and what it forces me to do. First off, it, it, it forces me to give God my full attention as I'm right, as I'm praying. 
But when I explained this to my therapist, what she said was, she says on a neurological level, it enters our brain differently when we write it down versus when we just whisper it or say it in our own. Now, if that's true, then me telling myself, you know, Andy, man, Andy's haircut really angers me. Every time he signs on a meeting, he's got the same hair. He's much older than me, but how come he still has hair and I have none? And I start to develop this resentment. Right? And and it festers and it festers and it festers and, and whatever it is. And I start to think it's no big deal. It's just hair. And it's I love Andy. Why would I be angry at his hair? Right? And I, I'll, I'll excuse it and I'll... And then something happens... When I take that through an inventory and I say I'm resentful at Andy because he's got hair and I don't, and that makes me feel this way, and I feel that others should feel that way, and what I want and what I need to be okay with this or that, and I start to realize yet again that I'm crazy, right? And so I I come back to this idea that there's something greater than me that has to restore me to sanity, that has to restore me to wholeness, that has to bring me back to a place where I'm the most effective here and outside of here. And if I write it down, something magical happens. My pen snitches on me and the truth comes spilling out onto the paper. And by the time I'm prepared to share that with somebody, it almost feels ridiculous, right? As I move through my sobriety, the thing, the big glaring crazy things that came out of my first inventory, they don't come out anymore, right? Thank God. Those things, right, there has been spiritual progression. But what happens is that my ego, which is constantly reinventing itself, starts to tell me, you don't need to talk about it. You don't need to tell anybody about it. You're sober, man. You should be able to handle that. You're good. Don't worry about that. How many times I've read fit, fit steps to someone and heard fit steps from someone and they're going through their pages and they go, oh, oh, this one really seems silly at this point. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah. Do I, nah. But left without a trip through the pages through the columns can drive me crazy. It's me trying to manage it. And my biggest problem has always been my my constant need to rely on me. When self-reliance has failed me time and time again. Right? I speak to my sponsor once a week, Monday mornings at 8 o'clock except this past Monday because I was camping in Connecticut and I forgot to call him. Remember I told you, not a perfect program. So, and most times when I call, that's when we do work, right? It's our, it's our hour of the week to do work on the program. And anything that's ever disturbing me, ever, He can frame back to me in a way that says that you're relying on yourself. In my relationship, I want to maybe control or have the person, right, in in a romantic relationship serve me in one way or another. And I'm thinking that that's not the case anymore. And I get it spun back on me in this idea that I'm not letting God into my relationship. When I have a preteen in the house, who's going to be 13 in a couple months, God bless me. And, and he starts acting like a preteen. I start thinking that it's about me and my reflection, the, a, a reflection of my ability to parent. Or his behavior in school is going to be a reflection of me and I'm a fireman and I'm a pillar of the community. And can you, how is that everybody? Shut up, man. Right? Because what I don't see 
is that the cunning, baffling feature of alcoholism, this ego, is constantly coming back to tell me, yet again, that things are about me that aren't about. I'm still self-seeking even when I don't want to be self-seeking. I'm still selfish sometimes when I don't even want to be selfish. And that sounds a lot like drinking. I drank when I didn't want to drink. So sometimes these selfish behaviors inside of me, these, these, these disconnections from you and from God will resurface. And it is my job to return to this idea that God is everything. And what action do I need to take to A, reaffirm my dec- the decision that I made in step three, but also to move towards healing in that area? Is there repairs that I that need to be made? Are there repairs that need to be made in relationships, damages that I have done? Right? And so, and I love telling the story. Um, and so it, it, it is in constantly returning periodically to the step work, whether that be in a workshop and like, like Alex and I, we lead a BBA workshop. And when we lead a workshop, both of us usually go through the steps also at the same time as all of the people in the workshop. And, um, and so I am, ha- I was having trouble with my preteen, right? He's just being a 12 year old boy. And I can't seem to get through to him. And I can't seem to figure out what's, what, what having you to take. I was angry. I yelled. I restricted. I punished. I, I, whatever it was. And, and so I'm away on a vacation and, uh, and I start, and as I'm working on my step work, I start to come to a list of amends I'm yet to make. And I I worked for a store many years ago, and I borrowed some clothes from the store that I worked at. And uh, I never I never returned those clothes. There's a word for that. It's called stealing. And um, and I stole a whole bunch of clothes, and I owed them a lot of money for the clothes that I stole. And yet they could not. I could not just walk in the door and say, here's your money. There's no way for them to account for those dollars. And so uh, it is a store, though, a clothing company that that sole mission is to send their profits back to environmental organizations. And so my sponsor and I had decided that we were that I was going to donate the money that I owe them to environmental organizations. And. So when I worked there, I had gotten, I was able to get to a, uh, an opening of this environmental organization in the South Bronx. If you know anything about New York City, the South Bronx is not the best of neighborhoods and it takes these inner city kids and it teaches them how to build boats and how to live on the water and function on the water and how to clean up the water and all this other stuff and how to, um, and, and so I went to see if this place was still around. And I was going to set up a recurring donation to them as my amends to the company that I worked for. And so I did that from a hotel room in Costa Rica. And minutes later, excuse me, I got an email from the director of the company and I chose to leave the, the donation anonymous and the guy I don't know if his previous job was working for the FBI, but he figured out who I was. And he sent me a picture of my LinkedIn profile. He said, listen, we don't get a lot of donations like we used to, especially not from private donors. And I was just really curious as to who you were and where this was coming from. And so I said to him in the email that I responded, I said, you know, uh, I owe a debt to this company that I'll never be able to pay back. And And through a spiritual program, I found that supporting your organization will make those things right. He said, well, tell me a little bit about you. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a born, I'm a Bronx boy born and raised. And I have two children, a 12 year old son and a two year old, soon to be two year old daughter. And, uh, you know, I love supporting the organizations and I love being able to support you as a way to, to heal my own spiritual, you know, as a healing of my own spiritual path. 
he responded, well, why don't you and your son come down this summer and learn to build boats together and work on the water? I think that would be awesome. And so my son finishes school next week, and the week after that, we're going to start going down to Hunts Point in the Bronx and learning how to build boats and clean out the Bronx River waterway. Because something magical happens when I put my life in God's. There's no way that on my best day, on my own power, I could manufacture something that beautiful. There's no way that I could put things together that would allow me to tap into the love that I've been given here and share that with my son. If I'm constantly consumed by the idea of math, if I'm constantly trying to fix the things that I need, think need fixing, if I'm constantly trying to manage my life, and my relationships, and my career, and my finances. The question I'm constantly, I just constantly need to be asking myself is, is God everything or is he nothing? Right, and, and between Alex and I, it's almost because, become a half-joking thing when life seems to be absolutely impossible and just being like, like why? Right, and we kind of just shake our heads and we'll be like, Everything or nothing. God is everything or nothing. Right? Because, I mean, and and I tell my guys that I sponsor, I say, you have to be prepared that when you leave the house in the day, life is waiting on the other side of that door to punch you in the face. And as negative as that sounds, it's absolutely true, right? I have zero control over what's going to go on in life. Right, I can't walk out the door and not be sprayed with the bus on the puddle when I've got my nicest white outfit on. I can't like make the line at the bank move any faster. I can't be angry at the person who cuts me off in traffic. I just can't live life like that. And so at what point do I nurture my relationship with God enough that I surrender every single day when I wake up and I move through life as if I'm somebody who believes and trusts in God? When I nurture my relationship with God, when I do that, whether it be through prayer or meditation or service or whatever it looks like for you, the beauty of this program is that I get to walk it how I want to walk it. Um, Solutions occur. Solutions come as intuitive thoughts. They come out of meditations. They come uh, in ways that I would have never expected, like making the amends that I should have made a long time ago, coming allowing me to deepen my relationship with my son in a time when I was struggling to try and control it myself. Right? My daughter, right, the maniac, she'll be two in a couple of weeks. And she is a pandemic baby. Right? And there are articles on this pandemic baby thing. Her mom didn't go to work to you know, less than a year ago, and she they're used to being home with their parents and their family, and they were home, she was home with their older brother and her older sister all the time. And so she's incredibly clingy. Right? She just wants to be around us all the time. And so for somebody who likes to multitask like me and manage multiple things at the same time having a, an incredibly clingy little child running around the house needing her constant attention becomes very difficult. And I would get frustrated. And I would, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I don't know what's going on. And my son wasn't like this. And my niece and nephew weren't like this. And then one day I just st- stood back and I said, Dad, how do I do this? Right, Because I've gone through most of my sobriety as a single dad with my son. And so I figured, like, I got this fatherhood thing down. And what the ego tells me is that I can manage this relationship with my child. And so I take back a second and I, and I ask God for help. And the response that I receive was to give her your undivided attention. Now I've got stuff to do, God. 
I've got clients to message back. I've got emails to send. I've got laundry to do and cleaning to do and cooking to do and all of this other stuff. God, I've got stuff to do. Was what my ego responded with. And so I did exactly that. I took down all the books from her bookshelf and I sat down and I read through the books with her. I do have a ridiculous amount of sneakers. That wasn't a joke, right? I have, and and what's funny is that she likes to open up my sneaker boxes and look at the sneakers. And so we started going online and finding sneakers that look like daddy's sneakers. And we started ordering sneakers for her that look like daddy's sneakers. A lot of them are really funky and sneakers you can't find anywhere. I get them like from obscure people all over the country on eBay, whatever. And uh, And we started drawing shapes and colors. And we started walking around the neighborhood and just naming the things that we saw. And we started speaking to the people. Everyone that we saw, we just stopped and we talked to. We had little conversations with. She's going to be two in a couple of weeks and she can count to 20. She's speaking in almost full sentences. She can draw circles, squares, triangles, and rectangles. She knows every single person in this neighborhood. It's like Mr. Rogers in my little Bronx neighborhood. Everybody's always like, where's Summer? How's Summer? How's Summer doing? We go to Target and she talks to everybody in Target. She knows every single one. I mean, I spend entirely too much time in Target, but she knows everybody in Target by name, the security guards. And when I'm cooking, she, I just sit her on the counter and she says, it's hot, daddy. And she knows not to go anywhere near the stove. And she loves to help me cook. This morning, she was getting her nails done with her mom and sending me videos of her pretty pink nails and toes. And you know what? I still get everything that I need to get done. And yet I get the beautiful opportunity of seeing God in my daughter. I get the beautiful opportunity of being present because there's nothing... When I think of practicing these principles in all of my affairs, when I think of how I am to show up in the relationships of the people who love me and especially the people who love me and to whom I am responsible, there's nothing more valuable I can offer them than my undivided attention and my time. Right? I don't want my life to get so big because now I'm sober and I think I can handle things that I miss out on the beautiful little moment in life. I get to be a dad because you guys taught me how to love. I get to be a dad because I removed myself as a viable solution to everything, not just drinking. I removed myself as a viable solution to problems in life, period. Because the book tells me that I'm to come here for a relationship with God that will solve all my problems. And I will forget that. Right? I tell my guys as we go through the book, I say, circle all. Did you circle all? Okay. Underline all. Did you underline all? Okay. Box off all. Did you box off all? I will be presented with problems. Life will punch me in the face. My kids will get difficult. I'm going to get older. My car is going to break down. People are going to be mean. I'm going to fall short. I'm going to have a bad day at work. My mom is getting older, and I don't know how I'm going to handle that. She's also moving a couple miles away, and it's a couple miles too far. Where does God fit into those equations? You know, I drank my way out of my very first firehouse. And and they asked me to leave. Being the worst drunk in a firehouse is quite the achievement. If you've ever met firemen, they are the greatest. It's, you know, the fire department, no matter where it is, is the greatest drinking fraternity in the history of mankind. In two short years to be said that you 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 drink too much, guy. This is a pretty, pretty, pretty big achievement. And um it was also the most embarrassing moment up in my life up until that point. 
I've always struggled to fit in. I've always struggled to be a part of. I've always struggled to relate to men. I've always, all of those things are part of my story. And when I was two and a half years, almost three years sober, the fire department asked me to be the face of a campaign to bring awareness to alcoholism and drug addiction within the New York City fire department. And I got to tell my story and meet the mayor and meet the commit fire commissioner and meet the chief of the department and all that fun stuff. Um, also, when I got introduced to the mayor and the commit fire commissioner, I had a bagel stuffed in my cheek and cream cheese all over my face, but that's neither here nor there because God has a sense of humor. And, and going further, I might have an opportunity to work in the in-house treatment center for the fire department day to day with the guys who come in and say, I don't know how to stop drinking. You see, if I would have tried to manage my career in those moments, I would have fought the tide. I would have tried to figure it out. And I wouldn't have been able to show up the way that I showed up. And I wouldn't have been able to share my experience the way I got to share my experience. And today, that's not the case. I approach my career with a how can I serve? What can I bring? How can I be available for somebody who needs help? And that's within the fire department. That's not the people whose homes we go to. That's part of the job. When I come home, I look at my children and I say, where can I serve? How can I help? What can I do? Right? How can I show them a little bit of the God that you guys showed me? How can I teach them to love unconditionally the way you guys love me unconditionally? Because it is not so much my willingness to constantly live in Alcoholics Anonymous and help guys get sober and carry the message and be a rough and tough sponsor to these guys who need me. All of that is incredibly important. but I have to be a part of life as well. Alcoholics Anonymous gives me an opportunity to show up, right? I pray. And then I need to go out into the world behaving like a man who prays. It's easy to sound spiritual and profound from the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's easy to quote the big book and sound like I know what I'm doing and I, I really got this thing under control. The question is, in 7 a.m. traffic, is God everything or is he nothing? Right? When I really just need a, a cup of coffee and the line for Starbucks is out the door, is God everything or is he nothing? Right? When things just seem to be cascading upon me in a way that I can't possibly understand, is God everything or is he nothing? Right? And in the moment where I launched my own business and it starts out from the very beginning being way more successful than I expected it to be. In the moments when the good things are happening, is God everything or is he nothing? Right? Because I can't just decide to lean on God and trust that God is in charge when I don't have it figured out. Because I have to recognize in the good moments, too, that I'm here by grace and God is everything in those moments, too. Right? I'm not entirely sure what I said here today, and I hope that it made some sense to all of you. And I want to thank you for allowing me to show up at your meeting today and share my experience. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.